Thank you all for tuning in to Now You See TV. I'm your host, John Pounders, and as always, I'm humbled to be able to do this, and I'm, I'm all really thankful for my subscribers and the people that watch this show. Uh, today, we have an amazing guest. His name is William Schnobelin, and his testimony is probably one of the most impressive ones I've ever heard. Uh, he exposes deep secrets from the occult underworld like no one else I've ever heard before. I mean, he really, really has been involved deeply in Freemasonry, uh, I believe, I, he'll tell you what degree it was, but I, well over 33rd degree. Um, Bill, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Hallelujah. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm so so excited to hear more about your testimony. I mean, I've heard many videos on, on, the, on what you speak of, and man, I'm just so excited to hear more about it, and I know that my listeners will be excited to hear. So I, I don't want to uh, talk too long because I know that your testimony is very extensive and it goes reaches very deep. And so I'm going to go ahead and let you get started, man. Tell us about yourself. Well, uh, basically, uh, I've been I've been saved since 1984. Uh, but before that, uh, I was in a wide variety of things. I started out as a Catholic, a very devout young Catholic raised in a very devout home, as you can probably tell by the color of my hair. I'm an older fellow from, I was raised as a child in the 50s, and back when the Catholic Church was still very traditional and Latin and all that kind of stuff. And anyhow, I thought I was going to be a priest. I wanted to serve God more than anything. And uh, basically, the first thing that really happened that kind of knocked me off course is I was out on Halloween night one year. And, and back then, you know, you never heard anything about Halloween being bad, you know, certainly not in the Catholic Church, because as we've documented in some of our videos and teachings, it's basically the Catholics that brought Halloween to America about 120 years ago, because uh, originally Halloween was actually illegal. The founding fathers had it illegal. <clears throat> but anyway... Uh, I was out trick-or-treating, and um, beautiful October night, lived in a small town in rural Iowa. And essentially, I looked up in the sky at one point, and the sky was full of black things. They were like black, leathery things. And it was like being in a cave full of bats. That's the only way I can really, really describe it. And I just froze. I was terrified. And these things looked at me with ruby red eyes, and I felt this chill go through me. <clears throat> and I, I know now, many years later, obviously, that I was defiled at that moment by something from the dark side, something from evil, from, from Lucifer. And uh, I was walking with a friend, and he kept going, and he said, hey, Bill, what are you doing? And I looked at him, and I looked back, and all of it was gone. It was another clear night, starry night. But from that time on, you see, I started looking into the occult. I started being drawn, you know, from being, you know, because, of course, back in those days, you got to understand there was really nothing about the occult out there. I mean, unless you live in a big city, you know, and went into some old musty bookstore, you know, you couldn't find anything. There was no Barnes & Noble, at least that I ever heard of. Well, anyway, um, what happened was is I went on to college. I was going to minor seminary college to become a priest. And all this time, I kind of had a side interest in like UFOs and parapsychology and haunted houses, all of these things that are kind of at the outer, if you will, the outer innocent, quote unquote, fringe of the occult. And uh, I had a professor, a theology, a doctor and a priest theological doctor tell me, one of my teachers, that if I wanted to be Christ-like, which of course a priest is supposed to be Christ-like, I should study the occult because that's what, you know, the Lord did. He supposed, this guy, no, I never heard any of this, you know, he told me that, you know, Jesus, quote unquote, went to India to study with the gurus and he went to uh, Tibet to study with the lamas and he went to you know, Egypt to study with the, with the magicians there. And that's how he was able to do all the stuff he was able to do. Well, what did I know? I was like 18 or 19 years old. I didn't know the Bible very well, of course, because I was a Catholic. And I believed the guy. And so I started studying the occult. And within a couple of years, by the time I was like a sophomore at this college, I wrote to the king of the witches over in um, England and asked to become a witch. So I was studying for the Catholic priesthood, but I also was studying to be a witch. And I got initiated in 1968. 
uh, as a witch. And then uh, I took a leave of absence from the Catholic Church, from the, from the seminary after I graduated from college with a degree in music and education philosophy. And uh, I went off and, and uh, went to Boston, where the nearest coven was at that time to become a, a high priest uh, in, in Wicca, which is white witchcraft. And then from there, the problem with the occult is it's never enough. Occultism, magical power is like a drug, is what I tell people. And you get a little, you want more. You get more, you want a little more. And it keeps going. And that's how the devil works with any addiction. And I would submit to you that the magical power, which is real, it comes from the demonic, but it's totally real, uh, that it's one of the most addictive things of all because it gives you the illusion you have control over your life, even though you don't. Because obviously you're serve, you're a slave to Lucifer, you're a slave to the evil one, but you don't care, you know, he just chews you up and spits you out. So anyway, uh, went down to Arkansas to study under the Grand Master Druid of North America, uh, and he told me he was a 33rd degree Mason. <laughs> he was also a Mormon bishop, and he told me that if I wanted to really understand. The mysteries of Lucifer. I should get. I should become a master mason, and if I, he told me if I've ever gotten any kind of serious spiritual trouble, I should join the Mormon Church. So I kind of, you know, filed the latter part away because I knew nothing about the Mormon Church. I mean, about all I knew they had a choir and they had a lot of wives. That's what I thought, you know. Right. So anyway, uh, went through. This is in. I was now in the 70s. I got involved with the Church of Satan. I got involved with hardcore Satanism. I got involved with, with even the vampire thing, you know, because at one point I had to, if I wanted to progress within the kingdom of darkness, within the brotherhood, as it's called, of Satan, I had to choose. I could either go one way and become a lycanthrope or a werewolf, or I could go the other way and become a vampire. And I chose to become a vampire because it seemed, you know, sexier somehow. <laughs> and uh, so I, anyhow, I went through about a year and a half where basically I lived on nothing but human blood and Catholic communion wafers. That's all I ate. Wow. And uh, well, then uh, something amazing happened. Uh, every year I was sending a check to the Church of Satan that get their newsletter. They had, believe it or not, they had a newsletter then, and I'm sure it's now online, but it was called The Cloven Hoof. Mm -hmm. And I got the check back from the bank, and some lady in the bank out at San Francisco where the Church of Satan did its banking at that time had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in Jesus' name. And of course, I just laughed at it, because I at that point I was so deceived, I thought that, that Yahushua, Jesus Christ, was a... Uh, was the son of Satan. Right. He had died on the cross as a human sacrifice to save the world from the evil Jehovah. Yeah. That's what I was Gnosticism, taught. Gnosticism, you know. basically, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. kind of the whole demiurge thing. So, right. and, and by the way, I was also a Gnostic bishop. Wow. So I, I know all <laughs> what you're talking about when you're talking about Gnosticism, but that was a couple of years before this. So anyway, uh, I just laughed at this check, threw it in the bank, and within a couple of days, I was flattened. It's like all my magical power left me. I lost my job. I felt sick as a dog. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, I was one of the most powerful magicians, sorcerers, whatever word you want to use, in the whole western coast of Lake Michigan. Because at this time I was living in Milwaukee. And I didn't know what was going on, so I asked Lucifer for a sign. And uh, the most another amazing thing happened because what happened was is the um, – the next day, I got a phone call from these two girls that lived down in Chicago, which is a short, you know, train ride up from, um, up from, you know, from down, they're down, we're up in Milwaukee. Right. And they want to know if they can come and visit me because I was this great satanic priest and blah, 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 you know, all of that. And so I said, sure. They said they had something to give me as an offering. And I thought, well, whatever, you know. So they came, and when they got in the door, they were like two teenage girls that worship the devil. And, you know, what was really bizarre is they gave me these two Christian comic books about the occult. They were from Chick Publications. One is called Spellbound, and the other one is called Angel of Light. And they were both about the dangers of the occult. And they said, you've got to read these things. They're so dumb. They're absolutely Neanderthal. 
<laughs> and that was their great gift to me, you know. And of course, I just looked at them, pfft, you know, I thought they were totally stupid and threw them in a drawer and forgot about them. Right. Well, the next day, there was a knock on our door, and we opened the door, and it was Mormon missionaries, you know. And I remember what this Druid guy had said, Grandmaster Druid of North America, only have I ever got into trouble that I should join the Mormon church because they were started by witches for witches. Wow. And, you know, at the time, again, like I said, I didn't know much about the Mormon church. But I thought, this is a sign from Lucifer. This is a sign. And so invited them in, took the lessons, watched the flip charts, you know, got baptized. That was, it was August of 1980. Went to the temple. Salt Lake Temple in 1981, and basically rose up, and I, I'd given up smoking dope. I'd given up all the orgies and stuff. I, you know, I tried to be a good Mormon, in other words, because Mormons basically try to live a good Christian lifestyle, quote unquote. Of course, they don't know the real Savior from a doorknob, right. but they're they're trying, you know, kind of like the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, well, anyway, um, in the Mormon Church. And I mean, we can expand on any of these things as you'd like, but within the Mormon church, I began to realize things were not well. I realized I rose to the ranks. I became an elders quorum president, which is kind of like the assistant to a bishop. And uh, I was going out and home teaching. You know, the, there's a thing in the church, at least there was back in the 80s, where the elders would go and visit everybody in the congregation. It's called a ward every month to see how they're doing. You know, do you need your sidewalk shoveled like if it's a senior citizen? Do you need your lawn mowed? Can we clean out your gutters? And also to check up on you, you know, to make sure you're not drinking coffee or smoking cigarettes or, you know, hiding pornography under your bed or something like that. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, and I discovered that even the Mormon church present this, this wonderful, clean-cut, all-American image. Oh, we're all successful. We're all like Mitt Romney, you know, blah, 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 you know. And it's true. There are a lot of very wealthy Mormons. Yeah. Uh, they're very well-educated, too, and I certainly give them credit for that. But the, the point is there are a lot of Mormons that weren't going to church that felt so discouraged, so disgusted, uh, with the whole thing, because they, there's like all these thousands of commandments, literally over 4,000 commandments the Mormons have to keep. And if they don't keep them, they don't get into the highest degree of heaven. If they can't go to the temple, and again, you know, just to briefly explain something, in the Mormon church you have meeting houses, which are open to anybody, just like any church would be. But then you have temples, and they are more rare. There's now probably 20 or 30 of them in the whole of North America. Uh, where only elite Mormons are allowed to go. And the Mormons are taught that if you don't go to the temple and take out your endowments and get your secret name and blah, 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 you aren't getting into the highest degree of heaven. You're basically stuck in the cheap seats with all the devout Baptists and Lutherans and Catholics and Buddhists and Hindus and whatever. Right. So I was one of the elite. I went through the temple. And the temple is highly Luciferian highly Luciferian in its nature. But at the time, I thought that was okay because I had been led to believe the Mormon church was started by witches. Right. So that was no big surprise to me. So, But what was a surprise to me is that there were all these people that were basically dying on the vine. They weren't able to get victory over the vices in their lives. They weren't able to, to walk in any kind of, of, of joy or shalom, peace, anything like that. And that's because they don't have the real Holy Spirit. Right. But I didn't know that. So anyway, and many of your listeners may not know this, but most Mormon clergy do not get paid. They oh. work a full-time job, you know, 40 hours a week, and then they work another 20, 30, 40 hours a week for the church. Absolutely free. That's dedication. Yeah. I give them credit for that. You know, not many, not many, you know, Christian pastors would do that. So anyway, uh, I was really wearing myself out because I was working like 60, 70 hours a week. And one night I came home from home teaching, and one thing the Mormons get right, they do use the King James Bible. And I opened my Bible and just happened to follow up into Ma up Matthew chapter 11. You know, I think it's 1128 where Yahushua, uh, Jesus says, you know, uh, come all unto me, the labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon thee and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And I looked at that verse, and I just sort of 
laughed rather cynically and said, I, I you know, if this is rest, <laughs> you know, yeah. nuts to that. Well, yeah. anyway, you know, a voice in my head, I never heard this voice before. I know now it was the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go to Matthew 23 too. And I went to Matt. I didn't know what Matthew 23, I'd finally read the, here's the thing. Let me explain one thing. In the course of all of this, I'd, I'd become a Catholic priest in the old Catholic church. I'd become a Gnostic bishop. I'd gone through and gotten a master's degree in a Catholic seminary. So I had a master's degree in theology. <clears throat> I never read the Bible, not oh, once. Yeah. I'd read Soren Kierkegaard. I'd read Immanuel Kant. I'd read Thomas Aquinas, all this junk. I mean, I knew the basic stuff. You know, right. I knew the story of Moses and Jesus and all that. But, you know, I never read the Bible. Right. So actually, as a Mormon, I actually been reading through the Bible. Hallelujah. And I looked at this verse and it, in Matthew 23, and it talks about how, you know, one, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you bind heavy burdens, grievous to be born, and you will not yourselves lift a finger to help the people you're laying these burdens on. And that really smote me in my heart mm -hmm. because it made me feel like I'm being a Pharisee because the Mormons believe that, that one of their articles of faith is we believe that we are saved by grace after all we can do. Right. And we believe we are saved by obedience to all the laws, excuse me, the laws and ordinances of the gospel. So basically, if you don't keep all of these thousands of commandments, you're going to end up at the very best in the second level of heaven, and at worst, you're going to end up in the third, kind of the bargain basement of heaven. <laughs> and if you're someone like me, I mean, the Mormons would look at me because I left the church many years ago. I end up in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. So at that point, I really felt convicted. And I started studying the Bible, and I started realizing, you know, reading, you know, like Galatians, reading Romans, there's no way that, that this was compatible with Mormon theology because I'd actually taught Mormon theology. I was a paid teacher in the church educational system of the Mormon church. And so finally what happened was I moved to Dubuque from Milwaukee for personal reasons, and um, I plugged into the Mormon church there. And I was starting to, you know, move up in the ranks there. And I went, I got an adver advertisement for a prophecy seminar. And it was by some Protestant church. And I thought, oh, boy, I can go and I can steal some sheep. You know, I can wow them because right. I belong to a church that has a living prophet. Right. So I can really amaze these people with how awesome I am. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I went there and, uh, well, suffice it to say, this guy, this evangelist that was running this seminar, he just ate me for lunch. I mean, no matter what, I I never confronted a real Bible scholar. I mean, I'd talked to, you know, Catholics all my life, but most Catholics don't know the Bible from a doorknob. Even my seminary professors, this guy knew more than any of them did. And then finally, I said to him the one thing that Mormons always throw out to Protestants. I said, where do you get the authority to baptize so that people can be saved? Because, see, Mormons are taught that, you know, there's only two possible true churches, either the Catholic Church, which claims that it has this, you know, line of apostolic succession all the way back to Peter the Apostle right up to the present day, or there's the Mormon Church, which teaches that the Catholic Church apostatized in the third century, and if there was like, you know, 1,600 years of darkness, and then, tra -la, <laughs> this angel comes to Joseph Smith in 1830, gives him the Book of Mormon, the gold plates, and, and this church is restored. Right. And they would say that if you're like a Baptist or whatever, you're basically out of luck because you broke away from the Catholic Church. You're not a Mormon, so you're out there, you know, basically paddling up the stream without a paddle. Right. So I threw this at him, and the guy realized I was just playing games with him. And so he cut the quick. He says, where do you get the idea you need to be baptized to be saved? It says in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that was the verse that got me, right. <laughs> along with those other two that I'd seen a couple of years earlier. And it went right through my magic Mormon underwear like a bullet. <laughs> it smote me right in the heart. I went home. I, I still remember my hands were trembling on the steering wheel. 
And I was convicted. I just didn't know what it was. And so anyway, I got, I, you know, Mormons have this teaching. That if you're confronted with this deep spiritual question, you're supposed to fast and pray. That's not a bad idea. So I fasted and prayed. And then what they're taught is in Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of their fake scripture books, is that either if it's true, you'll get a burning in your bosom. If the question you're asking is not true, you'll get a stupor and you'll forget about it. So like I tell people, in Mormonism, there's the idea of spiritual discernment is either you get heartburn or you get stupid. <laughs> I got neither one. <laughs> so I finally, then I remembered those comics. This has been four years now. I remember those comic books. I dug them out of the thing because I remember in the back thing there was how to be a Christian. How to be born again. And I thought, I've tried every other horrible thing in the world. I might as well try this. So I knelt at the foot of my bed, took off my Mormon underwear, and prayed the prayer in the back, in the back of those comics and basically got born again. And that was June 22nd, 1984. Wow. It's amazing. And I needed, yeah, hallelujah. And I needed, over a period of a couple of years, I found out I needed some deliverance. Got got a hold of a really great four-square pastor who's since gone home to be with in heaven. But um, he helped me get free. And then I was called in the ministry in 1986 and have been in basically full-time ministry since 1987. That's amazing, man. That's a that's a very extensive thing. I know, like the Mormon Church, I believe wasn't Joseph Smith. He was a Freemason himself, was he not? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. He was a Mason. So was his brother, and so have been a lot of the Mormon prophets since right. then. I mean, like Brigham Young was one. I think uh, a couple of the other earlier Mormon prophets were Masons. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense that they would, uh, you know, started by witches for witches because. If people don't know about Freemasonry, I think most of the, most of the people listening know that know the truth about Freemasonry by now. But the, for those that don't, um, can you kind of explain a little bit about Freemasonry and why it's not exact? I have friends that are Freemasons, and no matter you know, they I guess they're like, well, you're not a Freemason, so you don't you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, well, <laughs> oh, you're right, I'm not a Freemason, but I know people that have been in Freemasonry, and some that are very high level, like yourself. I mean, um, there's. And I think in our town, there's one 33rd degree Freemason, and um, he, obviously, he's not going to talk to me about anything like that. And But there's other, but you're probably the highest that I've that I've heard of that actually came out of the occult. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain to people a little bit about what Freemasonry is and, um, and why they should stay away from it? Yeah, let's put a pin in that, and let me make okay. one other point about the previous subject. Okay. What I didn't know when I was a Mormon, but I found out later on in 1986 and 1987 when I was out in Salt Lake preaching, doing this Christian conference for my dear friend Ed Decker, um, is that Joseph Smith has been historically established to not only be a Freemason, but to be a witch, hmm. to be a, a warlock, if you want to call him that, a sorcerer. There's this Mormon historian, D. Michael Quinn, who was since excommunicated from the church, <clears throat> but he was a BYU professor, and he wrote this book called Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview, and I have a copy of it. It's now out of print, but it's, it's this thick, and the guy documents all the weird stuff, occultism, crystal balls, fortune-telling, talismans, necromancy, animal sacrifice that Joseph Smith was involved in. And this is a guy who's supposedly a prophet of God, you know, right. quote unquote. Right. And he was basically a con man and he was probably demon possessed to his eyeballs. So, you know, I just want people to understand that, that the thing that this Druid guy told me back in 1973 about the Mormon church being founded by witches wasn't just somebody, you know, blowing smoke up your skirt. Right. He was telling the truth. Yeah. And he knew because he himself was uh, an LDS bishop. So that being said, moving on to the masonry, the thing about masonry is <clears throat> masons say they are not a religion, but only religious. And that's just playing word games. Right. And, you know, basically masonry has all the qualities of religion. It requires you to believe in a supreme being. It has a system of morality. There's things you can do and things you cannot do. And that system of morality and ethics is expressed in ritual. It's very ritualized.
Christ. No Mason can deny that. So Masonry is a religion, and I would put it to anybody who's a, supposedly a Christian and a Mason, how can you be a part of two religions at once? I mean, you couldn't be a Christian and a Muslim. Right. You couldn't be a Christian and a Hindu. You couldn't be a Christian and be a Buddhist. So why would you be a Christian and be a Freemason? Now, the danger of it is, and we have a DVD which I think expresses this very well. It's called Freemasonry, Fatal in the First Degree. And people can get that off a little plug here for our website. Our website is withoneaccord.org. Uh, we have a lot of free stuff there. We have all of my books and DVDs. I've written eight books, and I've done countless. I could have probably 30 or 40 DVD teachings now. Plus, we're also on YouTube and on Facebook, all of that. But anyway, in this DVD, I document how even the first degree See, let's say you're a Christian and you, you decide to join the lodge because your uncle was in it or a friend was in it. Maybe your pastor was in it. Mm -hmm. And he tells you, oh, it's a great, it's a great institution. It, it makes good men better. Yeah. That's what I've heard that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's their yeah. little slope. Yeah. So anyway, you go there. You're interviewed by a committee to make sure you're not some kind of a pervert or something. <clears throat> That's another story. But <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, you were talking before about, you know, your friend David Carrico, our mutual friend. Right. And, you know, we'll both confirm to you that Masons actually have the highest number of pedophiles, perverts. I mean, they, they put the Catholic priesthood to shame. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was talking to David Carrico about that. He was uh, here locally. I don't know if you're familiar with the Blue House. The Satanic no. Blue House, uh, but they were one of the ones that broke it out. But they were, uh, they uncovered that Freemasons were the ones that were bringing these children away from the school, and they were doing sexual, um, uh, not sacrifices, but um, rituals, satanic sure. rituals on these children and bringing them back to the school. And it was happening at all these different schools, and all the people that were doing were Freemasons. So um, I, I can't, yeah, I mean, that's, it's just, look, when I heard about that, I was like, wow, that is, that is outrageous. I cannot believe that. It's so crazy, but it's true. And I looked it up in the, it's in the newspaper. It happened a few, uh, I think I want to say like almost 15 years ago, uh, here in our town and man, it's just, yeah. it's, uh, it's crazy. So, yeah. And, and I mean, we've, I, I mean, we've prayed for thousands, probably, you know, five, 6,000 people now to be set free from the demonic and so many of them come from Masonic homes where the father, the grandfather, the uncle was Mason. Mm -hmm. They were sexually molested as children, boys, girls, doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll get to why that is in a moment. But anyway, uh, they interview you. And then you're, now again, you're a Christian or maybe you're a deacon or an elder, or whatever, in a church. And you're taken to the door of the lodge. They take off all your clothes. They put these jammies on you with a bare breast, a one of your knees is bare, you know, it's like one of the legs is a short, like a short leg. And you're blindfolded. You're, you got a rope around your neck and even led to the door of the lodge. You knock on the door and you're made to say, you know, the guy on the other side of the door, you're blindfolded. The guy comes, says, who comes here from the other side of the door? And you're made to say by this guy who's conducting you, who's a lodge officer, Mr. Bill Snevelin, who has long been in darkness and now seeks to be brought to light. To receive a part in the rights and benefits of this worshipful lodge, erected to God and dedicated to the Holy Saints John, as all brothers and fellows have done before me. Now, notice what you just said. You're a Christian, and you're saying you've long been in darkness. Right. And this is the first thing you've done. You aren't even inside the lodge yet, and you've already denied Yahushua, Jesus Christ, who's the light of the world. Yeah. How bad is that? Yeah. It gets worse. You go inside the lodge. You're led around the lodge. You know, again, you're blindfolded. All this weird ritual stuff is done, you know. And you're made to kneel at an altar. <clears throat> at the altar, you, you're told to put your hands on a Bible, and you swear an oath. Now, in Matthew 5, 34 through 37, Yahushua says, don't swear oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than that cometh of evil. And that's, <clears throat> what do you want to call it? That's built upon by his half-brother James. In James's epistle, he says, above all things, my brethren, swear no oaths. Mm -hmm. That's pretty strong. Yeah. And so here you are. 
supposedly a follower of Christ, supposedly, you know, whatever, and you're swearing an oath in direct contravention of his commandments. Mm -hmm. But it gets worse. You're kneeling at this altar, you're swearing this oath, and it's, it's all this kind of long mumbo jumbo stuff, and, you know, like, le it's very legalese. Right. And at the end you say, got your hand on the Bible now, all this I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, you know, uh, binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots and buried in the sands of the sea where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours, shall I ever knowingly violate this my entered apprentice oath. That's what the first degree is called, entered apprentice. So help me, God, and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same. Now, that's pretty blood curdling. Yeah, it is. And the Masons say, oh, well, it's only symbolic. Well, the trouble is, if it's only symbolic, then you've taken the name of Yahuwah, of the Lord, in vain. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, it's for real, then you violated another one of the ten, ten Commandments because it says, thou shalt not kill. And you're basically saying, if I do blah, blah, I'm giving you permission to cut my throat and tongue my, tear my tongue out by the roots, which usually is fatal. Yeah. So right then and there, you've opened as, as a man, you know, because Mason, women can't be Masons, uh, a huge open doorway mm -hmm. for Satan to come in and trouble you. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing. <clears throat> if you study, and you see, the trouble is most Masons are like most Christians. Just like most Christians never read the Bible, most Masons never read their own books. Every Masonic library that I've ever been in, and I've been in a dozen of them, uh, uh -huh. Masonic Lodge, I'm sorry, has a library. Mm -hmm. And when I became a Scottish Rite Mason, I went to the Scottish Rite Library in Milwaukee. It's beautiful. It's huge. Probably four or 5,000 volumes, easy. You read these books. You know what you discover? You discover, <clears throat> you know, Masons talk about their deity mm -hmm. being the great architect of the universe. Well, really, if you read their books, their deity is symbolized by the obelisk. Mm -hmm. Like Washington was a Freemason. George Washington was a Freemason. The Washington Monument is the world's biggest phallic symbol. Yep. That is the deity of the Masonic Lodge. They basically worship the phallus. Mm -hmm. That's why they wear an apron, because the apron covers their holy of holies. And they don't, they don't tell people this up front yeah. because most Protestants and even most just plain old secular people would be kind of shocked by that. You guys worship the phallus, but yeah, right. they do. And, you know, and I don't think we have the time to get into all of that, but, you know, basically it all goes back to the legend of Osiris and Isis and the missing master's word, which is actually, you know, that Osiris's, you know, male member had been cut off and lost and Isis couldn't find it. Right. You know, and this is the problem with masonry is because whether these guys know it or not, they're worshiping the male organ, and that opens up a doorway for the devil to come in and trouble them in that very area. Mm -hmm. And you know as well as I do, most men have some trouble with that anyway. I mean, we mm -hmm. all struggle with, you know, sexual temptation and whatnot, but this is like blowing the door wide open yeah. for just any any unrighteous thing to come in, demons, perversity, and and for whatever reason, you know, Masons, and, and basically at the highest level, and mind you, no, um, probably one, one in a thousand Masons knows this. Even most 33rd degree Masons don't know this. The idea that you learn, because Masonry is basically an energy vampire thing where all the energy goes up to the top, and at the top is Lucifer. Mm -hmm. But right below the top, and we get into all of this in this uh, book I wrote, Masonry Beyond the Light, there's this idea that Masons can achieve immortality by sexually vampirizing children. Is it because they're, they, still, they're still in their innocence, or how is that? They're is still that... in their innocence, and they're still full of life force. Mm. I mean, if you take a five-year-old boy or a five-year-old girl, for that matter, and you violate them sexually, you've stolen their innocence, but you've also stolen all those years of life force. Mm. 
that means you can live that much longer. That, that, I mean, I'm not saying this is true. This think. is what they're taught. Right. And that's they, they talk about in, in when you, you, you do Masonic ritual, you're taught about the sure and certain hope of immortality. Mm. Well, their hope, they never mention Jesus ever in the lodge except in one degree, and that's in the, uh, pardon me, the, um, the, the York Rite's commandery. Mm. Otherwise, you never hear. And let me just ask you this. Where are you going to get immortality except through Christ? Nowhere, man. That's that's a lie yeah. from the that's a lie from Garden of Eden. The serpent's lie. You know, you can all become the, like gods. So yeah, all yeah. the way forward. So that is the danger of masonry. And you know, the, I mean, there's more to it than that. I mean, you know, I I spent a whole two chapters in this book, Masonry Beyond the Light, talking about in so many ways that masonry is um, anti-Christian. It's anti-Bible. It's even anti-family because it requires the master mason or even the entered apprentice, first degree guy, to keep things from his wife. All right. I don't know. I don't even know if you're married. But, yeah, you know, I am. I'm married. I've been yeah. married for 10 years. So. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's great. But, you know, you don't keep stuff from your wife. No. Not in, not in my marriage manual. Because that is a toxic thing mm -hmm. that can eat away, whether it's a woman keeping something from her husband or whether it's a husband keeping something from his wife. It eats away at the fabric of the trust, which I would say is one of the key foundation pillars of any marriage. I agree. So right then and there, you go to your lodge meeting, and you come home and say, oh, honey, what did you do in your lodging? Well, I can't tell you. <laughs> She's going to start wondering, you know, yeah. do you have orgies there? And no, please understand me. Masons don't have orgies. Right. But... I will tell you this. We've had, I bet, at least 200 people testify to us yeah. that during the off hours, you know, when the lodge is closed, quote unquote, the children testify now as adults of being taken to the lodge and being sodomized, being ritualized, sexually abused on the very altar where that Holy Bible sits during regular Masonic rituals mm -hmm. and their cries and their screams and the many blood that might even be shed is offered up to the, to the Elohim, the false God of masonry, which is Baal. Because if you want to get back to the basics, I mean, this phallic symbol is Baal, right. who's the ultimate, you know, one of the, he is, I think the ultimate false deity, mm -hmm that surrounded Israel under several names like Moloch and Chemosh and whatnot. Right. And that's what they're worshiping. And most Masons don't know that. No, and because don't. of that, just because, and I tell people this, just because you don't know it's cyanide, if you drink a glass of water thinking it's poison, it's still going to kill you. And not only will it hurt the man, it will trickle down and contaminate his family, mm -hmm. his wife, his children, even even if he never touches his children sexually, the the headship is so defiled because of this filth that's pouring into him when he kneels at that altar and swears an oath to Baal. And like Elijah said in First Kings eighteen, how long halt ye between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. And I would tell you that the Mason is trying to do both if he's a Christian, yep. and he can't do it. Yeah, man, I I know that. Uh... The, the thing you're talking about, the head of the household, though, whether a man wants to admit it or wants to claim it, no matter what, he is the head spiritually of the household. And when you do stuff like that, you're absolutely right. It completely defiles your home your home and everything like that. So I know that um, the, my first encounter, I guess, with Freemasonry was uh, my uncle was um, a Shriner and also Scottish Rite. I guess he was like the higher level Scottish Rite and and Shriner, and, and I don't know if he started out, in, I guess you have to start out in Freemasonry before you go to the Shriner, so he was probably that too. And, well, um, you got to, let me just explain okay. that. you got to go through the Blue Lodge, which is the first three degrees, and then you can either go Scottish Rite, which is 32 degrees, or you go York Rite, which is 10 degrees. You said your uncle was in the Scottish Rite. And, then uh, you Shriner, go into yeah. the Shrine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so he... Uh, Anyway, I was outside one day. I was helping this local church, and I was passing out waters for people, and they were trying to build a church there. So I was helping the guy that started because I knew the guy. And um, we were right by the Shriners tent because they have the downtown in our area. They have this huge, huge building, and they ha they own like half the city block uh, downtown there. So like there's that Freemason Lodge, the Shriner Temple, the Scottish Rite. It's all 
right there. And they have the Children Learning, Masonic Learning Center, which is kind of creepy as well. But uh, they, they got one of the guys there. I was talking to him, and and um, he said, hey, man, you want to see your uncle's picture? And I was like, I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, well, your uncle's, you got, we got your uncle's picture here in the lodge. Come in here and check it out. So um, I went inside there, and I looked at it, and and uh, they're like, you know, you should join. You know, this is something, this and that. So I was like, well, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe I should. So I went home, and I was looking at the information, and the guy contacted me. He's like, we got a meeting set up for you. You can come here, and you can, you know, we can do this. So they're going to check you out and stuff like that. And um, when I and I was I was pretty excited about doing it. Then all of a sudden, I got this horrible feeling. I got this, like, just completely just – I don't know how to explain it other than it felt like somebody just punched me in the stomach really hard. Just a really horrible, horrible feeling, and and so I yeah. started praying about it, and I started thinking about it, and I went online and I started researching it. And you're one of the first videos that I came across, believe it or <laughs> not. And this was, you know, nearly, I guess, five or six years ago after I became a believer. And um, so I started hearing what you had to say about it. I was hearing other people what they were saying about it, and I was so thankful that God put that that uh, horrible feeling inside of me otherwise i probably never would have researched it because to me freemasonry was nothing at that point because my uncle was one he was also a baptist minister um all these different things so like i didn't think anything negative about it at that point and um so yeah i mean i'm, I'm just people need to really research what they're getting themselves into uh because i'm so glad i'm so glad that put god put that bad feeling inside of me because i would never would have researched it to begin with so you know, if you're listening to this, there's no such thing as coincidence in the Hebrew language. Uh, everything <laughs> that everything that we that you do, you're called. You're right now. You're listening to this for a reason, and so I know that there's somebody listening right now that is interested in in the Freemasonry. Um, and listen to Bill; he's been through it. Um, th I'm thankful for him to come on for sure. I know we could. Uh, I, I want to. I guess go. Unless you have something more you wanted to say about Freemasonry, I, I, I guess the original reason I wanted to have you on was to talk about a little bit about vampirism because it's really popular right now. Yeah, uh, and uh, and well, I know. Let me let me let me just say one other thing, if I might interrupt, about the Masons, and that is, okay. I would you know I think it's a wonderful testimony what you shared, but I would just challenge if if there are any people that are supposedly Bible believing Christians listening to this show tonight, I would challenge them as to why don't they feel that voice mm -hmm. that you're talking about, that impulse within themselves that says this isn't right. Yeah. Where is their spiritual discernment? Because I'll tell you a true story. When I first got born again in 1984, about a week or 10 days later, I went to a Masonic Lodge meeting. It was a noon luncheon. It was called a High 12 Luncheon. And I went into that building, had the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life. And I felt so awful yeah. walking into that building. I felt so oppressed. I couldn't wait to leave. Yeah. And my question to you, Christian Freemason out there, if you're listening, is why don't you feel that conviction? Have you seared your conscience over the years because you think, oh, my dad was in it, my uncle was in it, you know, my pastor's in it? Well, none of those people are going to have to account for your sin. Only you are responsible for your sin. And you need to repent, renounce the lodge, send a letter, demit to the lodge, and get out of it. And on our website, with oneaccord.org, we have a sample letter that people can send to their grand lodge, whatever state, like you're in Indiana, they might be in and get out of it. Because otherwise, the devil will have all the right he ever wants to chew on in your family. Yeah. And only through the power of Yeshua will you be free from all this stuff. It's important that we use his name, and it's important that we bind things in his name. And I know that um, that's the only way you guys are going to be free. So exactly what Bill said, if you're not feeling it, you need to examine yourself as, as portrayed in First John. Uh, look at that. How do you examine yourself? How do you know if you're in the Messiah? If you follow his commandments, you're in the Messiah. If you're not, you're a liar. It's pretty simple. And so yes. if you're if you're not doing those things... Um, then you're not in the Messiah, and if you're not feeling those things, then the Holy Spirit is not, um, you, you may have grieved him to the point to where he doesn't, um, you know, visit you. So it's now's the time to accept the Messiah. Now's the time to ask him into your life, and not only just to ask him into your life, but to do what he says, because the whole point of following him is to do, do the things he did and to go after what he tells you to do. I mean, what's the point in following somebody if you're not going to 
You know, if I'm following somebody up a treacherous mountain, what's the point in saying I'm following them if I'm really not actually following what they're doing? I'm just kind of stumbling around myself. That's that's what a lot of believers are doing right now. And I didn't mean to start uh, doing the you know gospel presentation, but I always it, seems oh, like it okay. always kind of slips in there. So I'm glad you know I just want people that are listening to really take hold because a lot of my listeners are not Christian. Uh, I have witches and stuff that'll listen to some of the programs I've had ex uh, spiritualist. Uh, I've had all these different people and they listen to them, but I want to make sure that they know the truth and not just, you know, wow, this is a cool story or whatever. I mean, that's, that's not what we're here for. We're here to tell you that there is a light and it's the light is your path or the light lights your dark path because in this world we're stumbling through a dark path. We're walking around and without the light that is shining through Yeshua, we're walking, we're falling over rocks, we're hurting, we're doing all these things without that light, which the word is the light then you're going to stumble. So, but anyways, man, I'll get off that tangent for right now. Um, if <laughs> I, well, I, yeah, that, so. I, absolutely. I agree. I would just add one thing to that. And that is, you know, <clears throat> people ask me, you know, is all this magic stuff real? And I say, yeah, I mean, I saw some pretty bizarre stuff when I was into the occult, I was into ceremonial magic. I was into to Satanism and all that. But I would say this, I have seen more astonishing things, more wonderful things, miracles, signs and wonders. I could spend a whole hour just talking about them since I got born again, since I renounced the occult and became a servant of Yahushua than I ever did when I was a witch or whatever, you know. So if you're into the occult or witchcraft or whatever because you want power, come to Messiah. If you are into it because you want wisdom, it says in Colossians that Yahushua is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So believe me, I've learned so much more about the universe, about the Bible, about life uh, than I ever thought possible when I was into the occult. Yeah. So come to him. The fear of Yahovah is the beginning of all wisdom, and that's that's exactly the truth, man. That's that's the only now I, before. Before being a believer, I thought I was smart. I thought I, you know, I'd studied a lot of the Freemasonry books that I didn't really realize were Freemasonry, but you know, like Morals and Dogma, Freemasonry, uh, reading all these different occultic books because I was searching for what was truth. But after becoming a believer, it just all ties everything together. I was explaining to my wife last night we were talking, and and she was saying, "So how come there's so many different religions?" And and I was like, "Well, there's really only two. I was like, there's polytheism." And then there's Yahovah. The rest of them are are all sun god worship. They're all kind of tied into Gnosticism, and they all that. And because we were talking about you and how you did all these, different, she's like, how could he do all those different things? And I was like, because they all tie in. They're all the same thing. They're all at the very top levels. Once you understand them, they all are the same. They all merge and mesh, and um, they're all by Lucifer. Obviously, the 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 uh, he's the god of that religion. So. Um, anyways, I don't know where I was going with that. I kind of lost. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man. So, it, well, you're right. I mean, really there's only, you know, there's religion and then there's the Yahushua. Yeah, exactly. And, and true biblical, you know, walking in, in the Bible is not a religion. Mm -hmm. It's about a relationship, a loving family relationship with our heavenly father right. and with his son, Yahushua, the Messiah. Exactly. And that's that's the story. Yeah. So if you're in a religion, that religion isn't going to get you to heaven. Mm -hmm. Only Yahushua can get you to heaven and following right. him. Exactly. And you don't need a man over your head telling you what to do. You don't need any of that stuff. I mean, God made it pretty clear that, you know, uh, we don't need a man to teach us. We need the Holy Spirit. He'll guide us into all truth. And, and so if there's a priest or bishop or whatever that commands your attention commands your not you know not your attention but commands your um allegiance allegiance or whatever then you're you're following you're doing something wrong and i believe that's in uh was it in colossians as well the or is it corinthians the the talking about the head coverings the covering that's of a man one corinthians yeah, 11 first yeah. corinthians 11 so uh but yeah man i wanted to get into a little bit i know we don't have we it's already 50 minutes in if we if you if you want we can come back again um next time and talk more about the vampirism I would that's up to you i mean i can go a few minutes over if you want okay you know, yeah let's do it man 10 minutes, 10, 10 minutes after the hour you know and yeah. do a hour and 10 minutes that's fine yeah how whatever you want to do i don't want to keep you too long i hate i know that uh sometimes i have a habit of 
Uh, you know, I, that's why I quit doing blog talk radio. I used to do blog talk because almost every time I would go well over the time allotted to me. And, and it was like, uh, man, and, and it was, it was my fault. I'm, I don't keep an eye on the clock very well. And I just kind of roll, but whatever yeah. you're comfortable with, if you feel like talking about it, man, I would love to hear more about it. And if not, we, you know, if we want to do a second time, some other time we can do well, it. Either well. way, whatever, I'll leave it up to you. I'll leave, how about, uh, let's just, let's just roll with some of it. I just want to sure. ask you a question about it. Sure. Um, so vampirism, that is very popular right now. Very popular that, you know, they made all the different vampire movies and I, I don't know how many, there's so many different ones. I don't even know, know where to oh, start. There's, there's hundreds of them by now. Yeah, there is. And so many young people are interested in this. I was, I can't believe it, man. I was there of my, uh, my niece's friend, I believe she's, I don't know how old she is. She's like 15 or 16, but I was looking at my niece's Facebook while I haven't seen her in, in a long time. Or not my niece, I'm sorry, my little cousin. And she has a friend that's all into into vampirism. And it kind of freaked me out. I'm like, I'm really hoping my little cousin's not getting into this stuff. Because it's real. It's not It's not just some, like, you know, fantasy. I mean, I remember seeing an I was in Olive Garden one day. And there was a vampire guy sitting there. He was drinking. He had a chalice with blood drinking this blood. So it's very real to some people. And in it's Olive very, Garden? At Olive Garden, man. He didn't eat any food. Wow. His girlfriend was there with him. Dressed in all black, he had the he had the I guess the teeth sharpened and everything. He had a chalice with blood in it, drinking this blood, and um, it was it was uh, that was one of the first times I ever seen one uh, in person. And I know that there's probably some out there that would do would claim if this guy I could I could sense the dark presence on him. It wasn't just some guy that's like you know or some lady that's kind of a little, little bit infatuated with. He was dark dark into it, and I could feel it on his presence. Sure. And that's what happened with you. You were into black magic. And um, you got into the vampirism. Tell us a little bit about that, because to me, that's so uh, not just fascinating, but it's just uh, there's a, it's an underworld that most people have never heard about. Well, basically, as I, as I said at the beginning, I got pretty high up in the in this thing, the brotherhood, and there was this fork in the road, and I was I decided to go the route of becoming a, a vampire and Nosferatu in the Romanian. And uh, there's this whole ritual thing I had to do, which I'm not going to go into, but, you know, basically it involved large amounts of cocaine for one thing. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, then at the culmination of several weeks of this, this dark being, which I now believe was a fallen angel, came to me and cut open his chest and had me drink blood out of his chest. And he infected me at that point. I think it was some sort of virus. And, you know, it was supposed to turn me when I finally died into, into an undead immortal being that would live forever and walk the earth. And, you know, just like in the movies, kind of. Well, anyway, uh, I did that. And it did make a difference. And I know this is all demonic. I'm not saying this is, this is in any way biologically real. Right. But the devil can do amazing things to the human body if you open up these kind of doorways. Mm -hmm. And I could, like, I could not walk out in the sunlight. After that, I had to get a third shift job working for the Milwaukee Sentinel, delivering newspapers into boxes. I mean, I couldn't, I literally could not eat. I couldn't drink water. I could only drink uh, wine or grape juice. The only thing I could eat was human blood and uh, communion wafers, Catholic communion wafers that have been consecrated. Because I see, I was an old Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, and fortunately, I had all these women in the, the network of covens that were more than happy to let me bite them in the neck. So, you know, every other night I'd have a different woman and, you know, bite her in the neck, drink a little blood. And you know, that was how it was going, but it got worse. Mm -hmm. Be there's a reason, you know, people don't understand this, but like in the Bible, it says, in the days of Noah, right after Noah got off the ark, the Almighty said to him, don't drink blood. When, the, you know, the creator of the universe came down to right sign, Mount Sinai to Moses, he said, don't drink blood. In the book of Acts, in chapter 15, you know, James, the, the bishop of Jerusalem church said, don't drink blood, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a theme there because it says in Leviticus that the blood is the life. And, you know, it's sacred to, to the Heavenly Father. And that's why, you know, um, we warn people don't, don't eat things like blood sausage 
or blood pudding or things like that, you know, that actually has, you know, beef blood or whatever kind of ugh, anyway in it. So, so I was actually doing this. I was, I, I was, I was living like this and it was getting bad because I kept needing more and more and more. And, you know, like any addiction, I would submit to you that blood is worse than heroin. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful addiction. Not, I mean, if you just, if you like, you know, prick your finger and you go like that, that's not what I'm talking <laughs> right, about. Right, right. What I'm talking about is drinking, you know, like a pint of blood, which yeah. is what I was basically doing. And it's a big deal too, because one of the one of, in Acts when they said that, you know, tell them not to eat meat sacrificed to idols and not to drink blood, those were like the two things that they told them to tell the Gentiles because after. You know, after that, they can go and it says they can go in the synagogue. After that, the synagogue laws taught in the synagogue after that. But those were one of the two things that they're like, make sure to tell them this right now off the bat, right. you know, because this is important. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, just the very act of drinking blood defiles you. And I'm sure it brought in bazillions of demons. That's where I got some of the strange, you know, abilities I had. I mean, I could see in the dark. Uh, of course, I couldn't go in the sunlight, so I was kind of, that was sort of a bad deal. But, mm -hmm. and anyway, finally, it just got to the point that I was desperate. I thought I was going to kill someone. I really did. I, I was driving around the streets in Milwaukee at night delivering papers, and I'd see the occasional street person or the occasional hooker. And it was all I could do to keep from stopping the truck, jumping out, and ripping their throat out. Wow. Really. It was, the bloodlust was getting that strong. And then at that point... That is when this lady sent me the check back from the bank, and this woman started praying for me. And that pulled me back from the abyss, because otherwise I realized I probably would have either ended up dead or in a, in a nut house or yeah. worse. And I certainly would have gone to hell. Yeah, man. And it's a, you know, that's a warning out there. We, maybe one time we can get on here and go into more detail about all that. But sure. it's a warning to all the young people out there that think this is a game or think it's, you know, it's romantic or whatever. And it may, the, the, the people make it seem that way when in Hollywood, it makes it seem that way, but it's really not. It all goes back to if I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, but it goes back to a Nephilim, Vlad the Impaler, uh, one of the probably sons of the fallen or whatever, one of these fallen angels that uh, I'm not sure if it's Nephilim or a fallen angel, but it goes back to that. That's how deep this uh, this black magic oh, it goes. It goes back a lot. He's just, you know, He's Vlad the Impaler them. is just one of the most famous, you know, and he did. He drank blood, you know, yeah. but, but you know, and he may have been. He was certainly an evil enough individual, but, you know, people have to realize this goes way back to the dawn of time. Yeah. I mean, probably back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel because there's always this idea that and you even see this like you know people you see movies and even you know even like some of the stuff that is vestigial that's carried over from like Native Americans and whatnot, you know the idea you go out hunting, mm -hmm. you know, and I very much oh, yeah. anti hunting, but I know but what just you're going to say. Sake of, you, know, <laughs> you, you know, you shoot your first deer, you know, like you're a 15 year old boy, you're out with your dad, you know, you blow this deer to smithereens, you get to cut out his heart and, and eat it. Wow, this is this no ooh, thanks, man <laughs> thing, you know. Yeah. And this is you see this a lot. Oh yeah, you know, I've heard it, about it, it a lot. My friends have done it. I've never done. It. I've been no, deer I've hunting, but I'll enough. never, I'll never eat like the, to me. That's the most. I won't even eat like the heart and stuff of a turkey on Thanksgiving or whenever you know. No. What I mean, I, but so. there's this magical belief that if yeah. you know the deer is a strong, powerful animal, you eat the 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 heart of the deer, then you get that virtue. You get that you get that life because yeah. the blood is the life. Yeah. Well, imagine if you do that to a human being. Yeah. And the danger is, you know. There's an old saying that says that even though the boys throw stones at the frogs in sport. The frogs die for real. Mm -hmm. And even though young people get into this stuff because they think it's sexy, because they think it's romantic, you know, and they're playing with it, you know, either just in reality or even with video games or whatever or reading books, seeing the movies, it's real. Very and real. it can reach out and grab you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll tell you something. You want to talk about how romantic it is? Imagine. If you, you know, this is kind of gross. Let me just say, imagine if you didn't eat anything but human blood. What would your breath be like? Yeah. You couldn't drink water. I'll tell you, I went through so many Tic Tacs when I was a vampire. <laughs> I could have bought the company out. My my <laughs> breath smelled like a charnel house. Hey, Tic Tacs should, uh, should uh, advertise that, you know, made for... Uh, 
even so good a vampire like you know what i mean something like that yeah because yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. people don't realize that i mean your breath would just knock you over and imagine coming up to some innocent young girl and saying come with me and i will make you leave forever you know and <laughs> and breathe on them and like you know <laughs> their eyelashes fall out because his breath is so bad it, you know no it, it really isn't that romantic and yeah. And plus, there's the fat, and, and not to be delicate, but indelicate. But you know, if you're a vampire, you you cannot have sex. You know, wow. and, and that's and what so probably that's a lot of people are getting romantic. into it for. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's really pathetic. And the trouble is, there's a lot of vampire wannabes. Yeah. And I don't know whether this guy you were talking about that was in the Olive Garden, if he was just, you know, trying to be, you know, dark and gothic right. and sinister, you know, or whether he was really. A vampire. I've never seen anything like that. Of course, I've seen I people like that, but this guy, like, I could feel like a darkness. Like it was, yeah. it felt like he was peering into me across the room. Like he was just staring at me. Like he, like he could feel what I was, you know, me, and I could feel his. I was. It was really weird. And I've seen a lot of people that you know act like vampires or gothic looking or whatever. But like this guy yeah. had some something going on with him. I don't know what it was, but it was definitely creepy. But, oh, oh, they're out there. I'm yeah. sure in any good sized city, and I don't know how large your town is, but you know, in any good sized city, there's probably at least two or three of them. No doubt. And and there's more now. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's places like New Orleans, which is sort of like the Vatican of vampires in America. Yeah. I mean, there's like bazillions of vampires in New Orleans, but because of Anne Rice, yeah. you know, her vampire chronicles. But you know, it it is very dangerous, and it's it's you see, you know, when I wrote. I wrote a book about this plug, Romancing Death. Mm. And I got the title because I was reading the book of Proverbs, and it says in, it's talking about wisdom. And in Proverbs 8, 35, 36, it says, this is wisdom speaking, for whoso findeth me findeth life and mm -hmm. shall obtain favor of Yahuwah. Mm. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. And all those that hate me love death and that's what you have here with the whole vampire thing you have the romance or romancing of death people are in love with death young people especially and i think it's partly because there's you know we've we've driven the almighty out of the schools we've tried our best to i don't mean me but the society right. has driven them out of the public square you know, I mean, basically, we become a very secular society. There's nothing to believe in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason some deranged individuals are turning to vampirism. Some deranged individuals want to join ISIS. Other people want to join some. You know, they want something that gives meaning to their life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a kind of creeping nihilism, a belief in nothingness, and the idea that if this is all there is, I might as well just die. Yeah. You know, and that's a terrible way to feel when you're 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's because they aren't given hope. And hope only comes from Yahushua, from the gospel, from the scriptures. Otherwise, there is no hope. Totally and, agree. you know, that that is why the churches have to minister in power. Because that's what, you know, young people want something that is real. Yeah. They don't want to sit in a pew and listen to something boring. Yeah. And I'm not saying you got to have heavy metal rock music in your church. I mean, Yahweh forbid. But I'm saying there needs to be the evidence of of power and of anointing, and that this is real to people. Mm -hmm. It's not just something that you know people sit there on Sunday or, or Sabbath or whatever. Because you know, I believe Saturday should be the day you worship on, mm -hmm. and you know, whatever. I mean, the point is, it's got to be authentic. Because nowadays, young people have a nose for the inauthentic, for the hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's partly why they're going into these things. Is they want something that's awesome, yeah. something that's mysterious. And Abba Father is very awesome. I mean, he's the most awesome thing in the universe. That should go without saying, but yet we lose track of that because we've diminished him. Yeah. You know, it's not, honey, I shrunk the kids. It's, honey, we've shrunk, shrunk the creator. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, right, man. That's not good. That's exactly right. Well, I am going. I, I hear my son crying in the background, uh -huh. and my my uh, my wife is at work tonight. She works as a oh, okay. nurse, so I, he's two that years old. Sense. I can hear him hear him in the okay. background. So, sure, but it's I about but time to end anyway. Yeah. yeah, man. And I appreciate you coming on. I really do because I mean I've listened to you for a long time, and to me this is really cool because 
I started doing these interviews because I want to know more about this stuff. I wanted to get the truth out there. I wanted um, I want people to open up to the truth, and and I I really appreciate you coming on. And Absolutely. and I um, if you would give your website, and I'll put it in the I'll also put it in the description down at the bottom of the video. But can you go yeah. ahead and give again? That? It is it's with one accord dot org. With one accord. W i t h o n e a c c o r d dot org. A lot of free it. stuff, a lot of resources for people. Amazing resources. And, I've, and Bill, I'd love to have you back on sometime. Maybe I can get David Carrico together and we can all kind of do some kind of well, like. That'd be, you know, I, haven't, I haven't seen him face to face in probably, oh my, 15, 20 years. Wow, so that'd yeah. be neat. He was really cool. He was, Like when I told him today, I was like, you know, do you know Bill Snowball? And he's like, yeah, I do. He was like, well, I'm interviewing tonight. He's like, really? That's so cool. Tell him I said hi. Yeah. So he was real excited to to you know hear that but uh um, yeah i'll definitely i'll be i'll be meeting up with them next week and maybe we can do yeah, something i'll else. give him my regards i will man and um anyways i appreciate it uh everybody listening once again i'm always really thankful for my subscribers and people that listen on a regular basis you guys make this uh make you know that you make this channel you you help you help do you you're the reason we do what we do and and go check out bill's channel as well is your uh your your channel is with one accord uh your uh name? we're just yeah we've just started out on youtube but if you you know it it probably is under my name dr william snablin okay and i'll put a link to his youtube as well uh make sure to go subscribe to him he does a lot of good teachings i listened to his most recent one about the blue seat seat and those are really cool i know a lot of my listeners are you know just like me and and, and bill were you know mess we believe in the Hebrew Messiah, we believe, you know, in the in the entire scripture. And so yeah. check check that out. And um, anyways, I appreciate it. I'll you talk bet. to you guys later and good night. Shalom.